the left came into the schools with their sex education and all these things reversed and shot up immediately afterwards. But nobody paid any price. Nobody who pushed that paid any price for it. Mm. What's going on today? We're going to be reacting to Thomas Sowell again. But instead of talking about politics, he's going to be talking about on the importance of love and marriage. So let's hop right into it. On the topic of love, be sure to show us some love by hitting that like, subscribe, and comment. Uh, segment three, love and marriage. The Thomas Sowell reader, quote, it may be a sign of our times that everyone seems to be talking openly about sex, but we seem to be embarrassed to talk about love. Facts. Yes. Explain yeah. that one for me. Well, I can't quite explain why that situation exists, but I, I do I have some ideas about the consequences of that. That people greatly underestimate the importance of uh, love. The human race could not survive without love, uh, not even physically, because uh, when a newborn baby enters the world, uh, there's an awful a lot of things demanded, uh, uh, and uh, w the baby is in no position to compensate anybody. Uh, and so the only thing is that the love of babies is what keeps them alive. And if the parents are so, uh, are so, so bad that uh, they don't have that, then the society has backup systems whereby the baby will still be kept alive. Mm. Again, the Thomas Sowell reader, love is one of those bonds which enable people to function and mm. societies to flourish without being directed from above. Yes. Love is one of the many ways we influence each other and work out our interrated, interrelated lives without the help of the anointed. Yes. Now, the, of course, the theme that runs all the way through this book, as we've already established, is the anointed, the intelligentsia. And what you're saying here is, in fact, a kind of brutal analysis. You are saying that their drive to power yes. is so extreme that in some way it leads them to smother their own natural instinct toward love and to disregard it in other people. Well, the, is that the, fair? The, well, or an lo, well lo, lo, love is one of the things that makes it possible for us to live without the anointed telling us what to do. But there are other things too that uh, create independence that the anointed are very much annoyed by, ranging from guns to automobiles. That uh, the, the whole thing, you know, the very. They, you know, I think I see an answer to Occupy Wall Street. It's Tom Sowell, and we're going to call it Love, Guns, and Automobiles. <laughs> But, but go ahead, explain that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep going, bro. Let's keep going. Yeah. With, with, without any uh, need to uh, seek seek direction from, from above, from the anointed, uh, that annoys them. Otherwise, they, they would be cut out of this loop entirely. All right. Marriage. Again, the Thomas Sowell reader, despite attempts to equate married couples with people who are living together as domestic partners, married couples, genuinely married couples, not domestic partners, are in fact better off by almost any standard you can think of. Close quote. Income. People who are married have higher incomes. Mm -hmm. uh, domestic violence. The rate of domestic violence in marriage is a fraction of what it is among people who are simply living together. The abuse of children. Uh, and married couples, uh, families, is a fraction of what the, what the abuse of children is um, among people who are simply living together. So if you put it to an empirical test, it's just very clear that marriage makes a difference. Among Blacks, Black married couples have had a poverty rate in single digits every year since 1994. So there is a difference. The stats show that the chances of um, divorce is increased for couples that were living together prior to the marriage. Mm. That's that's just really? the stat. Well, so you're, like, you're living more, in there. more responsible, I guess. I think there's a sense of commitment that is more elevated in married couples than unmarried couples. I think it's like the, the social stat? contract behind it. The stats, you mean? No, no, the, like the social contract behind it. And yeah. we know that there's obviously sense, different bro. tax benefits too. There's different legal benefits. There's um, there's a lot of different things that come with marriage. People aren't really wired to be solo their entire lives in terms of like the human experience and everything no fault divorce making divorce easier this begins in what the 60s i guess is when it really picks up steam there are a few states earlier than that no fault divorce is now uh it was a place across the country i have no clue no fault divorce so we look it up the court cannot consider rich spouse cause the divorce when dividing yeah. property the court mm -hmm. may consider if your spouse wasted marital assets without your consent 
or try to hide assets from the court. You don't need to, if someone had fault for divorce, you could just kind of divorce because you feel like it, I guess. So before, I guess you had to prove a fault in the in your spouse to divorce. I get it. Most recent no fault divorce is now uh, commonplace throughout across the country. Most recently, we have gay marriage. Mm. Uh, New York, what New York is, I guess, the third largest state by population these days. New York enacted gay marriage. Is there? A, uh, am I reading too much? Would you see a continuum of a kind of animus against this fundamental institution? Okay, I don't wait. <laughs> yes. Uh, wait, I don't understand the correlation with gay marriage, though. <laughs> <laughs> like he just kind of, he just kind of brought that up. He's like, he's like, oh man, these gays, man. I don't know. <laughs> There has to be some correlation somewhere. Yeah. Uh, am I reading too much? Would you see a continuum of a kind of animus against this fundamental institution? Of oh, marriage? yes. You would. Y yes. Uh, the first draft of the Communist Manifesto, which Engels wrote, uh, specifically wanted to uh, 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 dismember the family. And Marx uh, decided that that, 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 that wasn't going to fly. Uh, and so when he rewrote it, he left that out. But, that, but that's been there if you follow the left back over the past two centuries, you see in there one way or another where they try to undermine the decision-making autonomy of the family. Uh, Hillary they sense it as an enemy from the very beginning. Oh, absolutely. The Hillary, and Hillary Clinton said, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, and someone said it takes a village idiot to believe that. <laughs> uh, you know, that jokes, bro. Bro, this dude, I don't know. Not even look at this, bro, look at his entire body, bro. <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> what they're saying is they want to come in there and tell them. You see, it's, it's part of the whole thing of third parties wanting to make decisions for which they pay no price when they when when they're wrong. You see, when 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 the when the parent raises the child the wrong way, the parent pays the price when the child goes down the tubes. But these third parties can sit back in their air wherever they wherever they are, Washington or whatever. And if the things they tell us turn out to be wrong, it doesn't hurt them. For example, uh, before we introduced sex education into the schools in the 60s, the rate of venereal disease had been going down every single year. Teenage pregnancy had been going down every single year. I think it was the uh, rate of uh, uh, infection for uh, gonorrhea in 1960 was half of what it was in 1950. So all these things were going down before the, 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 the left came into the schools with their sex education. And all these things reversed and shot up immediately afterwards. But nobody paid any price. Nobody who pushed that paid any price for it. Mm. How would you guys that feel is? if, like, like, you know, we all have, you know, African parents. How would you yeah. feel if, like, instead of them saying, you know, don't go ahead and, you know, do this and that and the third, like, with ladies. What if they went ahead and said, here's a condom, be smart. Isn't that like a different change? Like, wouldn't you feel like a different change in the way they're parenting you? Like, wouldn't it give you like a sense of freedom to go ahead and do what it is that your whole life you felt like was not okay? I feel like the people with parents who are like more strict on that, they end up are the ones who like end up having it not so? safely. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, There's what? a lot of stories about, you know, pastors, daughters being the freakiest and stuff like that. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I mean, that is anecdotal evidence. So, I don't know. We don't know the actual facts, but I mean... It's definitely, I don't know what the right way to parent children is, but I would assume if I was to be, you know, my, my best guess would be to um, give the child the upbringing that is necessary to know right from wrong. And then from that point on, um, just trust that they will make decisions responsibly. Trying to direct your child into like the way you want them to live, it's never going to be successful. Just trust that the way you brought them up is going to have, like they're going to decide for themselves the right way they want to live. If I were a kid, and now we're like, uh, and, and someone was like, restrict me, it would make me want to do it more. You know what I mean? But like, I don't know. Compare, like, that, fight, compare, like, restrict. compare restriction to freedom. Like, too much restriction, compare that to too much freedom. What do you think is worse? I feel like guided freedom is better than restriction. Because at least that way, you can your child's going to talk to you. You know what I mean? There's not going to be any kind of, like, nothing hidden. Guided freedom. I think I'll, yeah, I the, could, the way I I'll put it that. is regulated freedom. Regulation will be like something like, um, there's a baseline of certain rules in the house. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you know mm -hmm. what these rules are. So if you cross these baseline rules, it's not like it's like the most extreme rules, just like simple this, you know, don't cuss when you're in my crib. Don't, you know, don't bring no, you know, weed or no this and that to my crib. 
just respect my household, you know, enough to, enough to teach the kids that there's a certain right and wrong, but not like, oh, sleep at this time, you know, get perfect grades. You know, that's like, you know, that's too much. You feel me? Keep it simple, keep it cool, calm. And I trust that from that baseline set of rules that they will evolve and understand like little by little by little building a, a, a moral stance for themselves and um, hopefully, you know, living a, a upstanding life as a citizen. If you want to like build a ship, don't uh, drum up like a hundred men to uh, gather up wood, uh, do labor and then dish out orders. You teach them to yearn the vast and the sea. And then that way they'll just do it themselves, I suppose. You know what I mean? Like uh, if you teach your kids, is this like something like you know, show love between like married couples or something like that? It's special. Maybe you will like encourage them. To be like I want to save this special moment for that special mm -hmm. time in my life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The creator of the uh, Game of Thrones, the director of the Game of Thrones, he says that he believes there's two types of directors. There's the ones that are gardeners, and then there's the ones that are um, like structureless. I don't know what the word exactly was, but just hear me out. The gardeners are the ones that like plant the seed. Is for example, they they plant the the plot of the story, they plant the specific characters, and then you just watch it unfold over time. You know what I'm saying? And then the the structuralists are the ones that are, they've already seen the end of the of the movie or of the story, and now they're forming but the plot so that it fits that ending. You know what I'm saying? Like everything that goes mm -hmm. on fits the ending. Whereas the gardener is like they've already started the the they've already planted the roots, and now they're just you know watering the seeds, they're doing everything this and that and the third, but they're not necessarily forcing that end to happen or any specific end to happen. He's just playing it out and trusting that it works out that way. The way I see a, a good parent perhaps will be something that falls along the lines of the gardener, where you just plant the seeds, you plant the foundation, you um, lay down the, the solid ground of how things are meant to be, and then you just watch them grow. Watch them grow and trust that it'll grow right, the right way. You know, water the seeds, you know, furnish it a little bit. Not too much like, you know, regulation to the point where a, a way to just assist if needed, not like, extremely you feel me that makes any sense you feel mm -hmm. me yeah because every every you know every middle eastern parent or every african parent wants their child to be doctors and lawyers and you know what i'm saying but like i feel yeah. like the perfect way to raise a child is to just give them the, the right you know beginnings give them the right upbringings and then whatever they do just trust that that's 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 the path for them all right guys if you enjoyed this video you know what to do hit that like subscribe notification bell catch you on the next one peace